The opinions mentioned in this episode are those of the host and the guest and do not reflect the views of any organizations, universities, hospitals, or other programs that might be mentioned. Also, do not take any topics discussed here as medical advice. Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, get clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. We interview preceptors and physician educators who will prepare you for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. So in this time of COVID, it can be very difficult to know what resources to use, where to get your information. So much misinformation, disinformation out there. And there's actually a clinical resource database now specifically designed for medical students. So today we have Dan Rosenbush, a DO, MPH, and the first year family medicine resident at St. Margaret's in Pittsburgh, PA. He's also a team lead for Students Against COVID. Dan, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. It's really great to be on here. So I am really interested in this resource because we come across so much stuff in the news and social media, and even for medical students that have a lot of training and even for physicians, as we're seeing, it's easy to be swept away by some of the information and not know what to really believe at this point or how cautious to be, how optimistic to be. What is your role with Students Against COVID? And tell us a little about that. Yeah, so... Students Against COVID started earlier this year in the springtime. It basically started from a Twitter post from a fourth-year med student in Michigan at the time, and she was posting about how people were using their time to basically combat the coronavirus pandemic. I had seen the post and posted what we have been doing at my med school, which revolved around this topic of getting good information out there. Basically, this group called Students Against Coronavirus started, and they have done a lot of different initiatives. They're an international group, and part of the group is producing this clinical resource database. There's a lot of similar databases out there also, but we just hope to be one that can be useful and reliable for people to use. So basically, we curate clinical and informational and educational topics on coronavirus and put them in one web page. It's basically a public Google Doc that we can share and people can look on and see topics from a wide range of coronavirus topics. And so as a team lead, I oversee the project and we have about 10 to 15 people who are submitting content and reviewing content, trying to keep the web page up to date. And so that's been my role. So this question about you know, getting good information out there has been near and dear to me. That has to be a huge undertaking, just the amount of new information every day and double checking it. A lot of research is even coming out before being peer reviewed these days, so we don't know if it's going to pass the rigors of the normal process. I'm curious as to how the curation works a little bit. Just brief overview. Yeah, definitely. And it's the one thing too with our group is we try to keep our database fairly high level too. So we're not having to sort through every research study that's out there, we're trying to post to places that have good and reliable information out there. But still, we do have to work through all those things. That's something we have to consider every time we post something. Coming on this podcast, too, that is definitely something I wanted to bring up and and talk about how can people find good and reliable information. Probably a lot of your audience is med students, I take it, right? Yeah, a lot of them are going to be med students, maybe a couple of educators here and there, but the bulk would be there. Great, yeah. Well, you know, so people might be familiar with a lot of these similar topics, but, you know, one thing I'd say is just looking for articles that are from an author that's well-respected or from a journal that's well-respected, you know, and I think people are familiar with a lot of those names, New England Journal, JAMA, the Landsat 2, as well as many others. There's a really great database, too, that the NIH has, and they've compiled basically all the coronavirus-related research that's out there. Go there if you want to be able to access any type of article related to coronavirus. So that's one I've used a lot. And then there's also a few other resources that we can talk about specifically later, but things like that going through a reliable organization are really useful 
way to go. One thing that's been useful for me in trying just to sort out things personally is looking at trends over time. If there's one study that comes out and completely contradicts everything else in the past, it might be worth it to be a little more skeptical about that study. doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, but if there starts to be a trend over time in many studies starting to say the same thing over and over again, that can lend a little more credibility you know, to those ideas. I also say, you know, look at funding. While it doesn't necessarily negate a study by any means, it's something to look at and see, could this have been a source of bias? And then lastly, you know, I'd familiarize yourself with statistics and the way that data is reported in studies. There's so much nuance to how data is reported that it's really helpful to know exactly what you're reading. So when you see a relative risk ratio or when you see a mortality rate or case fatality rate, it's really important to know how those numbers are being calculated exactly and knowing exactly what you're looking at. Because, you know, these topics are incredibly nuanced. And I think one of the difficulties with so much information coming out with coronavirus all the time, in one graph, we're seeing a slightly different picture that we're seeing from another graph. And the data could look different between the two, but they're maybe using related variables that are similar to each other, but might be coming from slightly different numbers. So really narrowing down and being specific about what you're looking at can help give clarity in those situations. I'd really say for anybody in the medical profession, it's worth it to familiarize yourself with biostatistics, epidemiology, and just some basics of statistics. It doesn't have to be anything too crazy, but just the basics of learning how to interpret common common research articles and things like that. It's definitely something that will be worthwhile. And anybody in med school, this will be something that will come up through your entire career. And so it's worth investing into this and, you know, figuring out the specifics of what you're looking at. Looking at studies, I think it's also helpful to think about what the implications of each study are. There's a lot of different things out there that could be interesting. This isn't just related to coronavirus. There's a lot of different things in science that are very interesting. It's also really important to take a step back and look, how will this influence my practice or how will this influence my patients? And if the answer is that this won't impact my patients or population, that's something to be aware of. I think the science that is most useful is science that will change practice and change how we treat patients and will change recommendations and things like that. It's not to invalidate science that isn't at that point or science that's more theoretical, but it's helpful to have that framework and that bird's eye view of where does this study fit in the grand scheme of the literature and is this going to change people's opinions or is this just one link in a chain that's still being built Keeping that bigger picture in mind in terms of what you're reading and how it can fit into the bigger picture. Those are all things I think about when I'm interpreting any research. It's by no means an exhaustive list, but those are just some things that I look at. And I want to say that epidemiology, biostats, that's probably one of the more complicated courses for med students initially. It's just so different than what we're used to. It's a lot of numbers, a lot of ratios. Mm It's not always as intuitive when you first start off. You really have to go through several different research articles and really calculate it out and do that on a regular basis. I kind of put it like math class. You know, you don't know geometry the first time you do each equation, but after doing sheets and sheets of practice problems, then you get a little bit better. Yeah, I would 100% agree, Chase. I think that's super important. And I think biostats is an interesting class as a med student because it is so unique. You're constantly learning biology and especially in The first two years, you know, we're so focused on the biochemistry pathways and mechanisms of actions and disease pathology that when we get to these mathematical equations and these statistics principles, it really can seem like something out of left field. But I will say just once people are in practice, it's important to be able to interpret research because that's something that we'll all have to do the rest of our careers. And research is coming out all the time and not just on coronavirus, but on every topic that we deal with every day. Being able to really interpret research well 
will serve people well and, and also help in their own research when they want to do that. So yeah, I do think it's important. I think you're totally right that repetition will make it better and make it more intuitive for students as you know, the more they do it. Yeah, I fear that a lot of people now, at least some more of the general public, when they say I've done my research, it means I saw a meme, I copied it, I pasted it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's bad. Which makes me think about this other issue that's come up recently is, you know, people are calling this an infodemic of misinformation right now. Social media has proliferated that problem in immense ways. When you have one friend post one thing and then another friend post another, there's no like credibility standards really. I know Facebook's implementing things like that and they're trying to do their best, but still, you know, there's no like threshold. There's no peer review process that's yeah. on social media. So it's hard to navigate. You see things like, I know it's been around for a couple of years now in the media anyway, as a popular term for it. What is it? dunning curting, I think. I've heard that phrase, but... It's the one where the less you know about a topic, the more confident you are that you're oh. an expert on the topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, get these yep. weird reposts and all of a sudden I'm seeing a lot of like business professionals and graphic designers and such that are now apparently expert virologists. Who would have known? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I know. And that's one thing that's unique to the scientific community is that we're required to acknowledge our own limitations. Even any study... It's a required portion of that study to acknowledge the limitations of that study. It's a standard that's not held outside the scientific community in the same way. So I think that's something that's been ingrained as a scientist clinician in all of us is that we have to be aware of where our knowledge gaps are, you know, when to seek out other advice. And I think that's something that we should be vocal about and spread that message more. No one can know everything. And it's really important to know when you need to look to other professionals, when to look to other people. And I think that's a concept that's not as popularized. I think it's important for people to realize those limitations. And I'll even say as a caveat, what we're talking about now, you know, neither of us are virologists. I know something that I've kept in mind for preparing for this podcast is not to say anything that's outside of my scope of education, to be careful with the things that I can be confident about as far as my education and my scope of knowledge for things like coronavirus and all of that. It's an incredibly important concept and idea for anybody who's forming an opinion about coronavirus is to know the limitations of their knowledge and to be aware of their knowledge gaps. Yeah, it's very important to point out that neither one of us are experts on the topic, but it does seem like you have a lot of resources from experts in your Google Sheets on the website. Yeah. What are some of the headline topics there that students can start to look at now? There's plenty. And too, while we're on that topic, I think for people that are sharing information, I think it's very reasonable for people to be sharing information with each other even if you're not an expert. And the important thing is just to recognize the limits to your knowledge and recognize when you need to refer people to other sources. I think you're still doing a good service. If you have done your research and you know about some topic, I think it's a very good thing to be able to talk about that and share that with others. That being said, some of my favorite resources and ones that I've found very useful is, you know, obviously the CDC and the World Health Organization. For anyone interested in clinical guides, I've really found useful the ACP guides, that's the American Academy of Physicians. They have a really useful clinical guide that goes into treatment, transmission, infection prevention, and it's continually updated and has references. That's a really good resource for epidemiology. There's the Johns Hopkins website, I think which most people have heard about. There's also a website called covidtracking.com. That's a useful one. It's more geared towards just interpreting some of the, I guess, more current news related to the epidemiology of coronavirus. It's put out by the Atlantic magazine, but it has some really good articles in there. People would be able to find a lot of resources on our clinical resource database as well. So if you just go to SACCOV19, 
clinicalresearch.com. You can go to the top there and on the menu bar on resources, there's clinical resources. So that's just sacov19.com. And we have links to many of the resources I'm talking about today. Yeah, that's perfect. And the ACP, American College of Physicians, pretty much if you have American Academy or American College in front of some sort of medical specialty, it's going to be one of the guiding institutions for that specialty and a relatively trusted resource. That's another thing that people can use, lay people or med students, is you know, look to your professional organizations and as I think is evident in the news, professional organizations can change their opinions over time, but they're run by very smart people and they have reputations for a reason. They can be very helpful in trying to sort through you know, quick moving data and things like that in times like this. Yeah. And no institution, no individual, no study is perfect, but at exactly. least there is history there. There's a lot of background that goes into it. There's a trend, like you said, follow the trend because the outlier is more than likely not going to be the most accurate representation in the long run. One of the difficulties that's, I think, happening now too is some portion of the public, there can be a mistrust of professional organizations. And I think that's probably contributing to some of the misinformation out there too. I hope people are able to look past that in a sense and be able to still learn from these organizations. And I don't think there's groups out there that are just filled with bad people that are trying to ruin America or ruin the world or something like that. I think these organizations are made up of regular people, just like anyone else, trying to do their best. They have families too and are working their day jobs and trying to get the best information out there for their own patients as well. And I don't think there's any reason to be so skeptical about a group just because it's a professional organization. Because that has contributed to a little bit, I think. And I think too, for the medical community too, we could do a better job at finding ways to communicate our ideas in more relatable terms as well. I guess going back to that infodemic idea, this is something that the World Health Organization has talked about a fair amount. They actually just had a conference in June and July about the field of infodemiology, which was a new term for me, but it's basically about the spread of information. The head of the World Health Organization has recently said, we're not just fighting a pandemic, but we're fighting an infodemic as well. So topics like these become really important. And the more we can do to get good information out there to people um, to help keep them safe and make good decisions, I think that's a win. And I think we do have to figure out how to convey these ideas in socially relevant platforms in ways that, you know, addresses people's concerns and addresses their reservations. And even if people are somewhat skeptical of professional organizations, I think as a medical community, we need to find out ways, how can we combat that? How can we convey our information the best we can so that it can do the most good, meet the public where they're at in a sense? And I think that's something that the, the medical community as a large, I think that's something that you know, we need to think about too. And how can we better communicate with the public? Just speculation here, but I'm going to assume that a lot of this is going to have to take place in primary care, in family medicine, because they're the ones that really are on the front lines of a lot of the interactions with patients when they're not in, especially mm-hmm. more dire straits where they're not there necessarily for the general education. And I know a lot of other practices where they interact with their patients a lot through email and text message and stuff like that. I think that's probably going to be a good way in the future and telemedicine now, especially to communicate one-on-one with people anyway. But that's just a little speculation tangent there. I think you're right that providers through our personal relationships, I think we can have a very large impact on patients. I've definitely seen where Patients develop a bond with a provider and they trust that provider in really incredible ways, even just beyond what their credentials would provide for. But it's just because of that personal relationship they have. And so I think primary care and you know any other specialty that's able to develop those types of relationships, that's an incredibly powerful way to have frank discussions with patients about their concerns and their hesitancies or their own thoughts about coronavirus in whatever topic it is. I do think the medical world has a ways to go. 
in learning to increase our trust, I guess, or increase how much trust the public has in the medical community. I think that's something that we can always work on. Learning how to communicate better and represent ourselves better. Because in the end, people go into medicine to help their patients. And communicating information like this and communicating good, helpful information is one of the best ways we can do that. You know, this is a really integral question for anybody in medicine. I think the infodemic and attention to this is also causing people in medicine to look at this question more. Yeah, right now, just people do not trust organizations in general, and that includes hospitals. Mm -hmm. But physicians and students, since we have a large student population listening to this show generally, can play a part in this role too, can disseminate accurate information and resources. And some of those resources could come from the resources and document sheet that you guys have. And I noticed when I looked at it a few days ago that it's broken down into several interesting sections. Could you just give an outline of what the main categories are? And also just to give a bird's eye view of that as well. The reason that we made it the way we did is that you go to this page, everything is on one page. There's definitely similar resources out there that have more links than we do. But the ones that we have, at least, I think are really useful and are maybe the highest yield information that we're able to come across. So we broke it into sections. There's a section at the very top that are just recommended resources. There's also a link for all the professional organizations' pages on coronavirus. So those are things you can Google, but we have it all in one spot, so it's just easy to find. We also have a link to another Students Against Coronavirus project that people had done where they had made flyers in 26 different languages because our group has been fairly international. There's students from over 45 different countries, and so there's many languages represented. That was a project that people had done, so you have a link to that. We have a link to clinical guides. We have a catch-all section just for things that didn't fit in any other categories. We have research collections, so like that NIH research collection that I had mentioned earlier. We have patient education material, some volunteer opportunities, and then some guides for special populations like people who are experiencing homelessness, people who are incarcerated as well. So those are some of the topics. And, you know, again, we're constantly trying to update this and make this usable and as relevant for people as we can. So continue to add resources as we're able to in the future. That's impressive that it's so international, so many different languages and cultures can benefit from the resources that you've utilized and collected here. I did want to ask about one other thing I noticed on the website, and that was the Safe Hands Challenge. Can you discuss that? Yeah, so the Safe Hands Challenge was basically just social media, basic education campaign to highlight the proper technique for washing people's hands and just to get people excited about washing people's hands. And it's funny because as much as I've just tried to read up on the research about coronavirus, many of the basics are still what's being highlighted today. Many of the first things we heard about, whatever it was back in the spring, are the same things that are best lines of defense against the coronavirus today. And one of the first and foremost is just washing hands. And so the Safe Hands Challenge was just to record some videos. And there's people from across our group, from across the world. And there was just a series of social media posts about, you know, washing your hands for the correct amount of time and things like that and trying to just to promote education around that. It was a great project. It was fun to see. And it's fun to see so many people from just across the world being involved in that. It's amazing that people are still having difficulties with the basics to some degree. <laughs> I know. I know. It's so funny because we've been studying this for how many months and our knowledge about it has increased so much. But still, it's, yeah, many of the basics are the things that are going to protect ourselves the best. Reminding people to do those things the best that they can. You know, trying to make good decisions about that. It is funny to think about how, yeah, the basics in some sense haven't changed a whole lot. Well, I think a lot of this information has been very valuable to the audience and we have a lot of great links that we're going to add in the show notes. Just one more time, it's SACOV19 or SACOV2 or COV19.com for the website. 
We'll have that in the show notes as well as some of the others that you mentioned. Do you have any other parting resources or thoughts for the audience? The only thing I'd add is just to really encourage people to take their time to read up on topics. Whether you're a med student listening to this or someone outside of healthcare entirely, take your time and learn as much as you can about medicine and the coronavirus and ask questions. I think just through having good dialogue about a lot of these topics, you know, I think is helpful in any case. I know some of these things can be so controversial when we're thinking about all the social issues going on that can be related to COVID. But I think frank discussions and trying to look at the evidence base and having people learn as much as they can, I think that can do a lot of good. As much as people can, just reading about these things and having conversations, I think is a great place to start for combating coronavirus and doing the best we can to take those steps and following the basics. Then too, if anybody's interested in joining Students Against COVID, come to the site. You can also find info about joining our clinical resources team if you're interested. Yeah, that's it. So otherwise, stay safe and keep washing your hands. That's all I'd have to say. Well, Dan, thank you for coming on and discussing Students Against COVID with us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Our Med Student Mentor Facebook group is a great place to gain insights and ask questions. This group is full of students and educators to guide you through your clinical rotations and ask your clinical questions. So search for the Med Student Mentor Facebook group now and learn how to become the clinician or educator that you want to be.